Well, it's a delight to be with you. As I was um, listening to Philip Jenkins, or maybe I should call you Harry, um, I was uh, reminded, and I can't remember, it may have even been Os Guinness who I heard this from, it may have been someone else, but G.K. Chesterton once said that the church has gone to the dogs five times in history, but each time it's been the dog that has died. And you realize, um, and because of my calling, I suppose primarily as an evangelist, uh, that we are so locked into in Europe into having a view that the Christian faith must be perpetually in retreat that we are losing the confidence that you need in order to be able to share the conviction that comes from knowing Christ with other people. Now, what Jeff Fountain has asked me to do was several years ago, I was talking to him and we got talking about a man called Professor John Gray. And I was urging him to read him, and uh, he did. And as a result of me making a book recommendation, now I end up here speaking to you. So I have been given this very uh, ambitious title on calling the humanist bluff. Now, let me just put in a few caveats straight away, because to do justice to this subject would require me to address various different forms of humanism and look at various different forms of critique. And that would therefore give a well-balanced, informed, and thoughtful uh, analysis. However, as an evangelist, um, what I would like to do instead is maybe go for a slightly more provocative approach and immediately caveat my remarks by saying that I'm aware that this critique of humanism, which I'm about to offer to you, which actually comes from the pen of an atheist, uh, is itself um, remarkably controversial but I think raises some very important questions and maybe most importantly, questions for the church herself, which I think we ourselves need to answer. And I will be ending on a challenge, which I hope will be a note of hope, but I also hope will be something that will send us from this place asking ourselves some very, very serious questions. Now, Defining humanism, of course, is going to be difficult. Um, let me just take a few quotes from the Humanist Society as I've had a look at what they have, how, the words they have used to describe themselves. So let me just offer this um, in, uh, definition. Humanism is the view that we can make sense of the world using reason, experience, and shared human values. Please notice that word there, human values, and that we can live good lives without religious or superstitious belief. Humanists seek to make the best of the one life we have by creating meaning and purpose for ourselves. We choose to take responsibility for our actions and work with others for the common good. And then as you go through this, they say, we think that other people, for example, are moral concerns, not because they are made in the image of something else, but because of who they are in themselves. Humanism is a naturalistic worldview encompassing atheism. We believe that people can and will continue to find solutions to the world's problems so that the quality of life can be improved for everyone. Now, what I find interesting as it comes when we look at what it is that humanism may have to offer Europe is I say, as I find it is the, some of the atheists who I'm reading who have the most penetrating critique. And in particular, I will be quoting from Professor John Gray, now, those of you who may have had the misfortune of hearing me speak before will know that I do not often read reasonably long quotes. The reason why I'm going to do that this evening is so that to avoid any chance I may have of misrepresenting the forcefulness of what he wants to say. But Professor John Gray, up until recently, was the professor of the history of European thought at the London School for Economics. And his works, the reason I've chosen them, have not only sold in their millions, indeed now tens of millions, but have been translated into so many different languages now around the world. And to simply read the endorsements that his books have are eye-opening. Now, what he says and what he argues is that humanism is the new religion, the new faith of a post-Christian Europe. It is the dominant worldview that informs everything else. However, he says, a truly secular view of the world is one that does not permit belief in all the hopes of humanism. A truly naturalistic worldview, he says, and this is a quote, is one that does not, leaves no room for secular hope. Now, the reason he makes this argument 
is not that he feels that somehow humanism has gone, um, uh, is, is insufficiently strong in some forms of his atheism, but it is insufficiently uh, connected, insufficiently strong to follow through the conclusions of the truth we know that flow from science and philosophy as atheists. So what he says is that, and his central argument, is that humanism is simply the Christian faith expressed and delivered in secular terms, in which we have replaced the idea of God's providence with a conviction about the nature of progress. This is how he puts it. Christians understood history as a story of sin and redemption. Humanism is the transformation of this Christian doctrine of salvation into a project of universal emancipation. The idea of progress rests on the belief that the growth of knowledge and the advance of the species go together, if not now, then in the long run. However, he says, the biblical myth of the fall of man contains the forbidden truth. Knowledge does not make us free. It leaves us as we have always been, prey to every kind of folly. And so he's trying to argue, do you see, that the conviction that somehow progress, an increasing amount of sophistication will make us better people, is simply false. Again, he puts it here out in uh, more terms, and please forgive me for reading this at such length. To believe in progress, he says, is to believe that by using the new powers given to us by growing scientific knowledge, humans can free themselves from the limits that frame the lives of other animals. However, he said, Darwin shows us that humans are like other animals. Humanists claim they are not. Humanists insist that by using our knowledge, we can control our environment and flourish as never before. In affirming this, they renew one of Christianity's most dubious promises, that salvation is open to all. The humanist belief in progress is a secular version of this Christian faith. In the world shown to us by Darwin, there is nothing that can be called progress. The idea that humanity takes charge of its destiny makes sense only if we ascribe consciousness and purpose and meaning to the human race. But Darwin's discovery was that species are only currents in the drift of genes. The idea that humanity can shape its future assumes that it is exempt from this truth. So do you see what he is trying to argue here? This well-known famous atheist. He is saying that humanism rests on the foundation that there is something special about what it means to be human. This Professor Gray says, is the cardinal error of the Christian faith. The cardinal error of the Christian faith is that Christians believe that we were created in God's image, that there is something special about human beings. And therefore, exactly as Professor Jenkins has said, that we can talk about human rights, freedom, responsibility, and so on. However, Gray argues, all of these things must be myths if we are true to a scientific form of rigorous atheism. None of these things can be true. Now, I don't have time to give you um, all of this, uh, everything that he has to say here. But the phrase he uses, and I, I find it a captivating one, is he says, humanism consistently repeats Christianity's cardinal error, that there is something special about human beings. Now, at one point, very interestingly, he says, Christians can be forgiven for believing in the myth of personhood, that there are such things as persons, human rights, because they believe in the myth, he says, that they were created in the image of God. And therefore, we can excuse Christians for believing in human rights, human purpose, human dignity, and so on, because they have this conviction. But, he says, we know this isn't true. And, as I've been reading through some of the essays in um, the booklet in pr preparation for this conference, I think some of your other contributors have also made the point that no, in no other form of ancient religion or indeed in ancient classical writing do you find this affirmation of human dignity. You cannot find it outside of the Bible. This is what Professor John Gray, the atheist, argues, and I agree with him entirely. However, he says, and he is now talking to atheists, he says that we are soft atheists. He accuses Professor Richard Dawkins as being a soft atheist. Um, and various others. Why are they soft atheists? Because, he says, you will not go to the logical conclusion of your own scientific argument. And he says there are four things that we immediately conclude if we know that a strict form of scientific atheism is true. Number one, 
there is no such thing as meaning. Here's how he says it. If we leave Christianity behind us, we must give up the idea that human history has meaning. Neither the ancient pagan world nor any other culture has hum in human history has ever thought to have an overarching significance in terms, of human in terms of human beings. Secondly, he says, there are no such things as persons, or person or, and the idea of personhood must be rejected. Thirdly, since we are not persons, he says, in what sense can we be held responsible for our actions? There is no responsibility, contrary to what it says on most humanist websites. Again, this is how he puts it. We cannot choose what to be what we are born. In that case, we cannot be responsible for what we do. The upshot, he argues, of neuroscientific, neuroscientific research is that we cannot be the authors of our own acts. In other words, we are not morally responsible for what we do. That is the third blindingly obvious conclusion, he argues, as an atheist. And lastly, he says, we must completely abandon the idea of morality, which is what he calls an ugly superstition. Here's how he illustrates the point. Here is a true story, John Gray writes. A 16-year-old prisoner in a Nazi concentration camp was raped by a guard. Knowing that any prisoner who appeared without a cap on the morning parade would be instantly shot, the guard who raped the prisoner stole his cap. The prisoner knew that his only chance of life was to find a cap. So he stole the cap of another inmate asleep in bed and lived to tell the tale. The other prisoner was shot. Robert Frister, the prisoner who stole the cap, describes the death of his fellow inmate as follows. And now he quotes from Robert Frister's book. The officer and the capo walked down the lines. I counted the seconds as they counted the prisoners. I wanted it to be over. They were up to row four. The capless man didn't beg for his life. We all knew the rules of the game, the killers and the killed alike. There was no need for words. The shot rang out without warning. There was a short, dry, echoless thud. One bullet to the brain. They always shot you in the back of the skull. There was a war on. Ammunition had to be used sparingly. I didn't know who the man was. I was delighted to be alive. And now Professor Gray picks up the narrative and he says this. Okay, what does morality say the young prisoner ought to have done? It says that human life has no price. Very well. Should he therefore have consented to lose his life? Or does the pricelessness of life mean that he was justified in doing anything to save his own? Morality is supposed to be universal and categorical. But the lesson of Roman Frister's story is that it is a convenience to be relied upon in normal times. And so, he argues, we must get rid of this ugly superstition of morality. We need to embrace the scientific truth that only the fittest survive, and he therefore argues that we need a political theory in which we do precisely that. Only the fittest survive. Now, I agree with everything that Professor John Gray says if there is no God. So unlike some other people who are extract, extrapolating political conclusions from a form, hard form of atheism, I agree with every conclusion he has to make, assuming that he is correct in what he says. Assuming that there is no God. If there is, then the chain of events he says therefore should follow, I think are correct. Now the difficulty is, is in finding ways to communicate this. Now, I was privileged when um, uh, a few years ago I was invited to address a rather large group of people from the European Parliament. And the subject was, without God, where is Europe heading? And the people organizing the meeting said, well, we are hoping we make it 100 or so people, MEPs and senior members of the Council and Commission. We had 350 people come. The end of the presentation, the whole afternoon, the whole thing was meant to take about an hour and a half. We were there for three and a half hours because there were so many questions. A group of people came up and said, the material that has been presented, this is so important. If you're prepared to travel, we would like to arrange for you to speak to 100 parliaments around the world on this issue. There are some pressing issues that we learn, have to learn how to speak into as Christians. Now, what is difficult for me in this context is I spend most of my life either talking to Muslim audiences or secular audiences. I'm not very good about talking about how to talk about to them. Does that make sense? I just do it. So it's harder to provide the analysis than it is to actually do it for me. 
But there is one criticism that Gray makes, and it's the one I've ended with, that I think that the church in Europe, as a church in Europe, we have to sit up and take full responsibility for, and it's this. When he says that morality is a convenience, only to be relied upon in normal times. If that is true, if it is true that morality is simply a convenience, it was Leslie Newbegin, I think, who said that all Christians want to teach their children, you know, right and wrong, because it makes life as a parent easier. If it is only a matter of convenience to make our life easy, we have missed it. We have completely missed it. Jesus Christ told the parable of the Good Samaritan, like most parables which have shaped European thought to such a large extent and even shaped our vocabulary, we lose the impact of the story. The parable of the Good Samaritan is that the man is traveling on a dangerous road when he is attacked. Now, the first two people pass by. We think they are callous. They are not callous. They are acting in the interest of self-interest because you have to put the story in the setting it was given. If I were to say to you, I was walking through the streets of this city today and I saw a man beaten up by the side of the road and I passed by, you would think that I was callous, that I didn't care. If, however, I said, I was in Baghdad the other day, and as I was driving past, I saw some blown up bodies by the side of the road and I just went straight on by without stopping, you wouldn't think I was callous. You wouldn't think I didn't care. You would assume that I was acting in the interest of self-preservation. It's a dangerous city. There are many road traps. There are many bombs. It is dangerous to stop and go and see. You may well die. A man was traveling from Jerusalem to Jericho, Jesus said, and he fell among thieves. It is an uninhabited road. The first building built on that road that we know of was built in the 1500s by the crusaders because they had a military machine to supply it with food and water that road runs through completely inarable inarable is that even a word non-arable land there is no water there is no food that is why it was ripe for robbers it was a dangerous road the priest and the Levite who pass on by on the other side are simply making a calculated moral decision that it is more dangerous to, to keep, that it is safer to keep on going than it is to stop. The third man stops. He is a Samaritan. As we all know, the Samaritans hate the Jews. And he takes the man to an inn. But there are no inns on that road. However, off that road, if you're prepared to travel for a while, you will find many Jewish towns and settlements. Professor Ken Bailey, he puts it in these terms, and this may work best if you are an American, but I'm sure many of us will get it. Imagine, he says, that a red Indian is on a horse riding through the desert, and he sees a naked body lying on the road with arrows sticking out of the back. Now, we can safely assume, most probably, that the man, that, as Jesus told this story, who was being, who was being robbed, was a Jew. The reason being that it is highly likely that it, if it was ob obvious that he was a Jew, that the priest and the Levite would have stopped, but they have no means of finding out, is he Jewish or not? Now, we know they took his clothes, so he's naked. Therefore, we can also conclude that he's probably lying face down in the dirt. Without going into too much biology, if you're a Jewish man and you're laying face up in the dirt, there are some simple observational things that can be done <laughs> to ascertain your religious convictions. The guy gets down, he rolls the body over, and it's not one of his, it's not a Samaritan, it's a Jew. So he takes him to one of the settlements, to an inn off the road. So, let's go back to our red Indian. He's riding through the desert, he sees a naked body with arrows in the back, he spins it over. It's a cowboy. He puts him on the back of his horse. He takes the horse into Dodge City. He ties up the horse outside of the saloon and he carries the body in to the bar and places it in front of everybody. He then turns to the barkeeper and says, look, here is some money. This guy's one of yours. I'll pay for him. And I'll come back in two weeks and I'll settle up the bill. Now, as Jesus tells the story, he stops there. The Samaritan takes the wounded man into the inn, and then he says, which one acted as a neighbor? 
But the story isn't finished. What do you want to know happens at the end of this story? What do you want to know happens to the Red Indian? And the answer is, does he get out alive? Does he leave the saloon bar alive? Or do the other cowboys come around, form a mob, put a noose around a tree, and hang him? The Samaritan walks into the midst of his enemies, where he is most likely to be held accountable for the very body he is presenting, and he pays for it all. This is not a matter of convenience. Christian obedience, Christian morality, the Christian life has never been a matter of convenience. Jesus Christ said, if anyone wants to follow me, he must pick up his cross, deny himself, and come. Otherwise, you cannot be my disciple. It is impossible. As the Western church, are we living this gospel? If we were to stand before our fiercest critics of atheists, agnostics, whatever they may be, would they look at us and conclude that we have domesticated our Christian faith to make us feel better about ourselves? Or would they conclude that we are prepared to lay down our lives for a truth that we could not possibly deny and that we will not renounce? Is the evidence there? We need to call the humanist bluff about the ideology that lies behind humanism. At the same time, we need to listen to the criticism they are making of us. Can it be seen? I was in a country just a few days ago, and I just I can't name it for obvious reasons. I was talking with a man. We're planning a series of 20... Um, I even want to be careful what words I use. 20 groups to go out in this country once a month. So that's going to be 240 over the course of a year to get, hand out Bibles to people who were asking for them. And there are two things that hit me about as we were planning this. Number one, these people cannot find people to give them money to hand out Bibles. It's going to cost $2,000 a month to fund 240 evangelistic missions. And as we were working through, the second thing then hit me. We got to the end. He says, do you mind if we build into our budget $1,000 to pay for medical treatment for when people are beaten, when their arms are broken, their legs are broken, and so on, so that we can get them some basic medical treatment? These people are willing to lay down their lives for the gospel. In Europe, we now have a form of the Christian faith that seems to ask for nothing, demands nothing, and costs nothing. I would like to suggest it is not a form of discipleship that Jesus Christ ever endorsed. We must be prepared to lay down our lives. I was talking with another dear brother just a few days ago, and he was telling me about one of his trips to Afghanistan. And as he was uh, going through Afghanistan with a big satchel on his soldier filled, shoulder filled with Bibles, he was stopped by, by uh, two Afghani police. Actually, the way he was stopped is they have dogs which apparently are trained and they bite onto your clothing and they drag you towards the policeman so the policeman can keep their guns trained on you. So he was walking and these dogs came as if from nowhere, grabbed his clothing, started dragging him towards this pickup truck. And when he was about halfway there, they said, drop your bag, drop your bag. So he dropped his bag. And when he finally got to the vehicle... They said, what are you doing here? And they searched him. And on his body, they found six Bibles. And they said, who gave you permission to give these away? Do you have a license? He said, yes, I do. They said, where is this license from? Is it from the Afghani government? He said, laughed. He said, no. Then, because he's Pakistani, they said, Pakistan? He laughed. He said, no. Now they look very confused. So they looked at each other. They said, UN? He said, no. They said, where is this license from? He said, my license is in my bag. Can I go and get it? So he went to his bag. He pulled out another Bible, came back and opened it up to Matthew 28. 
and read to them, go unto all the nations and make disciples. And he said, this is my license. Now, at this point, a guy leaned forward from the back of the pickup truck. He was an American major in the army. He started laughing. He said, are you a pastor? He said, I am. He said, I'm not a Christian like you, but there's a captain in my unit who's a Christian like you. And he called over this young woman who was a Pentecostal. They start talking for about 30 seconds, and she breaks up to a big smile and gives him a huge hug. And then the major says, let him go, let him go. He's not hurting anybody. I think there are many philosophical, moral, even sociological, and maybe even now we might even say psychological, which I haven't even touched on, bases, bases to challenge the humanist proposition. I think we need to find ways in which we can gently, lovingly, kindly, and hopefully in a way that allows us both to present the gospel and get invited back, although I grant that's not always possible. And at the same time, let us listen to what they have to say. Are we willing and prepared to lay down our lives for the gospel? If we're not, it doesn't matter what words we use, they will never be impressed. Let them see the truth of this in our lives. May God bless you.